Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shremate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Deve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Samyavadi Paschacha Desatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Panchakau Patarubhyas Chakripa Sindhu Bhai Vachapati Tanam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namanamaha Okay, so let's share the screen here. Is everyone able to see PowerPoint? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, sir. Okay, so we're on uh, unit one of the Bhagavad Gita here, and we're on what? Chapter four, the second half of chapter four. And chapter four being transcendental knowledge. And okay, so here's the overview, the breakdown of the chapter. We heard about transcendental knowledge about Lord Krishna, the, his mission in coming to the world and the importance of understanding his birth and activities to be transcendental. And then chapter goes on to explain about Lord Krishna as the goal of all paths and the creator of Varnashram. And so th today we'll hear about karma yogi, karma yoga for the jnani, sacrifices which result in knowledge and then the summary of transcendental knowledge okay so result of knowing the conclusion of karma and akarma this is an interesting section here sometimes people have a little difficulty in understanding this section about karma and akarma. Lord Krishna describes here in the verse, even the intelligent are bewildered in determining what is action and what is inaction. Now I shall explain to you what action is, knowing which you shall be liberated from all misfortune. Okay, so there's karma and there's akarma. Karma meaning no karma. That's chap that's verse number sixteen. And from Prabhupada's purport on that verse, one has to follow the leadership of authorized person. To act in Krishna consciousness, one has to follow the leadership of authorized persons who are in a line of disciplic succession. As explained in the beginning of this chapter, right? Who knows the beginning of the chapter? How was it explained? About the line of disciplic succession? Yes. Can you give me the translation? You've got the Sanskrit. Do you know the translation? Yes, sir. Yes. The supreme science yeah. was thus received through the chain of district succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that, in that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science, as it appears to be, lost. Right. The succession was broken. What's the Sanskrit term? Nashta, yoga nashta. Yoga nashta, right. Yoga nashta parantapa. The, 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 the line was broken. And what was the cause of the break in the line? 
Why did it break? Kalena Mahata. Kalena by the in the due course of time. Yes. But what what happened in due course of time to cause the line to break? Someone? The, the knowledge was diluted, Maran. Was... Yes, right. The knowledge was changed. No, they began to change. Them. Either they added things or they took things away, but they didn't preserve the, the knowledge in the parampara. Should not add anything, shouldn't take anything away. Srila Prabhupada used to say, don't change anything. He wanted us to keep... Now, it's interesting because Prabhupada, he, he would say, I never changed anything, from, but Prabhupada did change some things, right? What were some things Prabhupada changed? Raj, the number of rounds, uh, the number of rounds like previous was 64, but for uh, considering the fallen nature of the followers, he made it 16 rounds at least, right. minimum. Right, yes. Anything else? Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada made Maharaj Brahmacharini, sorry, I took your point. And uh, also Prabhupada started his own worship in front of teachers. These were another two changes that Prabhupada. Okay. Zone worship in front of Jesus and uh, Brahmacharini Ashram. And what? Brahmacharini Ashram. Like, uh, Brahmach Ashram. Yes, Brahmacharini Ashram, right. So, another thing that Prabhupada changed was, you know, introduction of devotees to chant Hare Krishna and do Sankirtan and preaching in Western clothes, not exactly um, spiritual clothes. Okay. But they were doing Sankirtan in Western clothes. Okay, yes, good. Right. And sannyas is crossing ocean, Maharaj. Sannyas is crossing ocean. Yes, yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, we made a few changes. A few, we could we say these were not, not changes in the principles, but changes in the details. Right? The principles were there. The principle, chanting Hare Krishna, preaching Krishna consciousness. Just some details were changed. So that's the important, important. Okay, so uh, otherwise even the most intelligent men will be bewildered regarding the standard action of Krishna consciousness. For this reason, the Lord decided to instruct Arjuna in Krishna consciousness directly. Because of the direct instruction of the Lord to Arjuna, Anyone who follows in the footsteps of Arjuna is certainly not bewildered. From the purport of verse number 16. All right, so text 17. The intricacies of action are very hard to understand. Therefore, one should know properly what action is, what forbidden action is, and what inaction is. So, action. Karma is prescribed action. Vikarma, prohibited action. And akarma, without reaction to work. In other words, inaction. So, if you're following the Vedic scriptures, that's karma. And if you're not following Vedic scriptures, if you're going against the Vedic scriptures, that is vikarma. And when you're doing devotional service, that is akarma. In action. Srila Prabhupada explains, besides bhakti, it's all vikarma. <laughs> right? Apart from bhakti, everything else is vikarma. In other words, if, if it, bhakti is akarma and everything else is vikarma, means the karma is also vikarma. <laughs> Prabhupada explains, one has to apply oneself to such an analysis of action, reaction, and perverted actions because it is a very difficult subject matter to or, or to understand Krishna consciousness and action according to its modes. One has to learn one's relationship with the Supreme. That is to say, one who has learned properly or perfectly knows that 
Every living entity is an eternal servitor of the Lord and consequently one has to act in Krishna consciousness. Okay, there's a typo error there. Let me change that. And that every... Every... Okay. Every living entity is an eternal servitor of the Lord and consequently one has to act in Krishna consciousness. So this is the duty of everyone because we're all parts and parcels of Krishna. So we're meant to serve Krishna. And if we're not doing that, then that's we karma. The entire Bhagavad Gita is directed towards this conclusion. Any other conclusions against this consciousness and its attendant actions are vikarmas or prohibited actions. To understand all this, one has to associate with authorities in Krishna consciousness and learn the secret from them. This is as good as learning from the Lord directly. Otherwise, even the most intelligent persons will be bewildered. Text 17 purport. So is this all right with everyone? If someone's not doing bhakti, then actually it's vikarma. So we have to associate with the pure devotees to learn this. And Prabhupada said, you associate with some authority in Krishna consciousness, it is as good as learning from Krishna directly. And then this is the, the bewildering verse, which people have sometimes they get a bit lost in. The real nature of karma and akarma. Karmani akarmaya pasyad, akarma, akarmani chakarmaya. Sabudi man manusheshu sayukta kritsna karma krit. One who sees inaction in action and action in inaction is intelligent among men and he is in the transcendental position, although engaged in all sorts of activities. So, if one is not so familiar with these terms, it can be bewildering. Inaction, in action, and action, in inaction. What does it mean? What is the meaning? We will see how it's explained. Karmani akarmaya pashyat. Inaction, in action. Inaction, in action means one is doing activities, but there's no reactions. So it's like inaction. Although so many activities are performed, there's no reactions from the work. In other words, it's akarma. So a person acting in Krishna consciousness is naturally free from the bonds of karma. So inaction in action is referring to the devotee who is working in Krishna consciousness. His activities are all performed for Krishna. Therefore, he does not enjoy or suffer any of the effects of work. Consequently, he is intelligent in human society, even though he is engaged in all sorts of activities for Krishna. Akarma means without reaction to work. The sense of eternal servitorship to Krishna makes one immune to all sorts of reactionary elements of work. So in this way, uh, the, the phrase inaction, inaction is explained that this applies to the activities of a devotee, that they're performing many activities, but there's no reactions to the work. The impersonalist 
ceases fruitive activities out of fear, so that the resultant action may not be a stumbling block on the path of self-realization. So those who are impersonalists, or the Mayavadis and so on, they're afraid to do karma. They're afraid of the reactions. So they stop all work. They're afraid that the reactions would block their progress and self-realization. And then action in inaction is now explained. Action in inaction is the opposite of inaction in action. Not surprising, right? <laughs> so action in inaction refers to the non-devotee. They may be renounced, they may be a sannyasi, and they're trying to stop all activities. Srila Prabhupada explains in his purpose, oh, oh no, this is from Burijan Prabhu, surrender unto me. A sannyasi without transcendental knowledge of Krishna may appear not to be performing work, but as a, as a soul, he can't avoid either activity or the entangling results of that activity. Devoid of transcendental knowledge about Krishna, he must act, but he cannot act in Krishna's service, for he has no knowledge of Krishna. He is thus liable to all reactions. Right? He, the sannyasi is trying to stop all activities, but he cannot, cannot stop. We've already studied uh, earlier, nobody can be idle, not even for a moment. All men are forced to act helplessly due to the impulses of the modes of nature, right? By the modes of nature, you may have to use the restroom, you may have to, you have to go to sleep, you have to, have a, you have to go for a walk. You have to you do things, you answer the telephone and so on, things like that. So you cannot just simply stop all activities. Nobody can be angry. Therefore, he, he's trying to do inaction, but the result is action. There will be action, there will be reactions from the work, even though he's trying to stop all activities. And he's not able to serve Krishna because he has no consciousness of Krishna. So inaction in action refers to the non-devotee. Inaction in action, sorry, refers to the devotee and action in inaction refers to the non-devotee. Now these have been described earlier. We're taking some uh, earlier verses which we've already covered to illustrate. Here you see from the second chapter, verse number 46, it describes how there's inaction in action. Yavanartha udapane sarvata samplutogate tavan sarveshu vedeshu brahmanashya vijanata. All purposes served by a small well can at once be served by a great reservoir of water. Similarly, all the purposes of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. I hope you remember that verse from 2nd chapter 46, right? The well, I was, we explained there's in, in a village maybe many wells, the one well for drinking water, one well for washing clothes, one well for taking a bath, like that different water, one well for water for cooking and so like di different wells are there. But when there's a great river or a big lake, reservoir, then you can use that water for everything. So the example is given like that. Then the same way the purpose of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. All the purposes of the Vedas. There's many different purposes of the Vedas. Right? We'll see today when we talk about sacrifices, different 
yak yes, which you can do, different things are prescribed in the Vedas, so many rituals are there for different purposes. So they can all be observed by one who knows the purpose behind the Vedas. And then in the purport to that verse, Srila Prabhupada explains, the rituals and sacrifices mentioned in the Karmakanda division of the Vedic literature are meant to encourage gradual development of self-realization. Self-realization means understanding Krishna and one's eternal relationship with him. So that in the Vedas there's so many rituals and these different rituals help one to gradually progress in self-realization. They're meant for that purpose. The purpose of the Vedas is meant for that, to come to that kind of conclusion, to understand Lord Krishna, who is the source of all the Vedas. And we're meant to also understand our own self and our relationship with Krishna. And so this is the real purpose of all the Vedas and all the other rituals, they're preliminary to that. So that was the second chapter describing inaction in action. And remember, who is doing inaction in action? Is that devotee or non devotee? Devotee. 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 Yes, okay. And now action in inaction, describing action in. Non devotee. Inaction. Action, action in inaction is a non devotee, right? Yes, Action yes. in inner, you can see. Karmendri ani sanyamya ya asti manasasmaran indri artan vimud atma mityachara sauchate. One who restrains the senses of action but whose mind dwells on sense objects certainly deludes himself and is called a pretender. A mityachara, mityachara is the pretender. So this is action in, in action. And from the purport of this verse, Prabhupada writes, there are many pretenders who refuse to work in Krishna consciousness, but make a show of meditation while actually dwelling within the mind upon sense enjoyment. Okay, so we can see these two extremes meant, have been mentioned earlier and now they've been included here, they're put together in one verse. Inaction in action and action in inaction. The real nature of karma and akarma. Chapter 4, text number 18. The sense of eternal servitorship to Krishna makes one immune to all sorts of reactionary elements of work. If one has that sense of being an eternal servant of Krishna, then you don't get, you're not going to be entangled in reaction. All right. oh, well. It's very hard to understand intricacies of action. Knowledge of action and inaction is explained now in five verses, which implies karma as a form of jnana. So five verses beginning text 19 up to 23, describing karma as a form of gyan. And we describe that also. Karma as a form of gyan is inaction. And the gyan is generally they, they like inaction. But we're doing karma, working, inaction, inaction. And so this is bewildering for for people. Even Arjuna had a difficult time to understand this fact, that he could be active and at the same time not entangled in reactions. 
it's something people have to consider carefully. And so it's doing karma, but doing it as a form of gyan. In that sense, so many activities are for performed, but without any karma, without reactions. Prabhupada explains, text 19 purport, only a person in full knowledge can understand the activities of a person in Krishna consciousness. Because the person in Krishna consciousness is devoid of all kinds of sense gratificatory propensities. It is to be understood that he has burned up the reactions of his work by perfect knowledge of his constitutional position as the eternal servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is actually learned who has attained to such perfection of knowledge. Development of this knowledge of eternal servitorship to the Lord is compared to fire. Such a fire, once kindled, can burn up all kinds of reactions to work. So Prabhupada is giving the example here of how the, what happens to the reactions to the work, is they're all burned up in the fire of perfect knowledge or the, the fire of eternal servitorship to Krishna, right? That mood of being the servant of Krishna is compared to fire. And just like the fire can burn up all the wood and all the fuel, so the same way this fire of servitorship burns up all the reactions which come from the activities. So this is the special nature of inaction, inaction, or karma as a form of gyan. Going ahead, to text number 20. Srila Prabhupada writes here from the purport, a Krishna conscious person acts out of pure love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore he has no attraction for the results of the action. Well, we hope you have pure love for Krishna, <laughs> right? That is the test of our Krishna consciousness. How much we actually have love for Krishna, it will determine how much we are attached or attracted by the results of the action. So ideally, Krishna conscious person, he is not worried, he's not interested in the results of the action because he's giving the results to Krishna, right? You have a right to do your duty, remember that verse? Yes? You have a... Yes? What's the translation? Yes? Translation? You have a right to do your duty, but... You are not entitled uh, to the fruits of your uh, uh, action. Right, but that you're not entitled to the fruits of your action. Never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of work, and never be attached to not performing your duty. Right? It's an important verse. What is that verse describing? What kind of yoga is being described in that verse? Yes, Niskam Karma, right. Thank you. So Krishna was encouraging Arjuna, he said, your adhikar is to perform Niskam Karma Yoga, right? <laughs> Later on, of course, Ar Arjuna will come to the level of devotion. But in that earlier, 
Krishna was telling him, you do niskam karma yoga. So a Krishna conscious person has no attraction for the results of the action. He is not even attached to his personal maintenance, for everything is left to Krishna. Well, that's, that's really a challenge for most of us, right? Because we are very much concerned about our personal maintenance. But coming to this level, if, you, if we're really on this level of uh, inaction, inaction, we don't even depend, we don't even worry about our maintenance. We just depend on Krishna. The devotee surrenders fully to Krishna. In the ninth chapter, those of you who have studied the ninth chapter, you will know how Krishna says, Yoga Kshema Vahamiyaham. He said, I carry what you lack and I preserve what you have. So uh, the devotee, you know, when fully surrendered, then we just leave everything to Krishna. Prabhupada continues, nor is he anxious to secure things, nor to protect things already in his possession. He does his duty to the best of his ability and leaves everything to Krishna. As an unattached person is always free from the resultant reactions of good and bad, it is as though he were not doing anything. This is a sign of akarma, or actions without fruitive reactions. <laughs> and we've added a little note at the bottom. Work now, samadhi later. But <laughs> sometimes we change it. We say work now, samadhi now. <laughs> the work is samadhi itself. It's not that samadhi has to come later. If we're in fully in Krishna consciousness, then the work itself is samadhi. Hmm. All right, is everyone okay about this? Inaction, inaction. And what is akarma? The devotee just fully surrenders to Krishna. He's not doing anything. He's just simply... He's unattached. He's not trying to enjoy the results. He's not even worried about his personal maintenance. He's just fully depending on Krishna. He wants to do his duty as well as he can. So he, he's, he's not worried about the reactions. The reactions may be good or they may be bad. But he's surrendered to Krishna. Krishna's arrangement. Krishna gives and Krishna takes. We have to surrender. All right? Uh, it is very hard to understand the intricacies of action. The state of one who has attained steadiness and knowledge is now described in texts number 21, 22 and 23. Someone who has come to this level of steadiness. We've added there, dovetailed with the supreme desire. Prabhupada liked to use this word dovetailed. It was always interesting to me how Prabhupada used these words in the English language. You know, we never speak about dovetailing something. Of course, dovetailing is a, it's a type of joint where two pieces of wood are joined together. We'd call it a dovetail joint. And Prabhupada connected this word into Krishna consciousness. So here in relationship to steadiness in knowledge, he talks about dovetailing with the supreme desire. We have our desires and we have to dovetail our desires with the desire of Krishna. This is the point. We have to connect our desires with Krishna. Or rather, 
Krishna's desires have to become our desires. Prabhupada explains here, a Krishna conscious person does not expect good or bad results in his activities. His mind and intelligence are fully controlled. He knows that because he is part and parcel of the Supreme, the part played by him as a part and parcel of the whole is not his own activity, but is only being done through him by the Supreme. When the hand moves, it does not move out of its own accord, but by the endeavour of the whole body. A Krishna conscious person is always dovetailed with the supreme desire, for he has no desire for personal sense gratification. He moves exactly like a part of a machine. As a machine part requires oiling and cleaning for maintenance, so a Krishna conscious man maintains himself by his work, just to remain fit for action in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. He is therefore immune to all the reactions of his endeavours. Like an animal, he has no proprietorship even over his own body. A cruel proprietor of an animal sometimes kills the animal in his possession. Yet the animal does not protest, nor does it have any real independence. A Krishna conscious person, fully engaged in self-realization, has very little time to falsely possess any material object. For maintaining body and soul, he does not require unfair means of accumulating money. He does not therefore become contaminated by such material sins. He is free from all reactions to his actions. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada is describing to us something of the characteristics of the person who was this uh, state of mind, the steadiness in knowledge connected with the Supreme, this example about the machine part requires oiling and cleaning. So a Krishna conscious man maintains himself, he has to work, he has to remain fit for action, he has to act in the service of Krishna. But then Prabhupada gives the example, like an animal, the animal who he may be sold in the marketplace, he cannot say, no, I'm not going to go, I don't want to go with that man. The animal is forced. He has no independence, he has no sense of freedom. And even the owner may sometimes kill the animal, but the animal cannot protest. So, has no independence. And Prabhupada was, in the beginning, he was giving the example about the parts of the body. When the hand moves, it's, 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 it's not by its own accord, but it's because of the whole body. The hand doesn't just move on its own, but the direction comes from the mind, from the heart, from the mind. And this way the hand will move. So a Krishna conscious person, he moves like the part on the machine, just like the part on the machine. 
the part when the machine moves, when the machine moves, because it's connected to the machine. So the same way we will see in 18th chapter, Lord Krishna describes how we are seated on the machine made of the material nature. So we're all connected. This is, of course, for one who is in this position, transcendental knowledge. Okay. So then Srila Prabhupada also talks that one who is actually in this consciousness, he won't do things like uh, black market or unfair means to accumulate money. He won't become contaminated by material sins. He's free from all reactions. Now if we do these sin things like that, you know, then you, you're going to get karma. But one who is actually in control of his mind, who is steady in, in knowledge, is simply surrendered to Krishna and is depending on Krishna for his maintenance. So this is the mood of the jnani. Text 24 describes the pure jnani's action becoming Brahman. A person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. So everything which is used by the Brahman, by the devotee, then it, it's spiritual. The paraphernalia and the offering and the results of the offer, the results of the sacrifice, is all spiritual. It's all of the same spiritual nature. Because the person is absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So the consciousness makes a difference because, it, because he is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So he's sure to go to this, the spiritual world and all of his different activities are spiritual. Everything which he uses, everything which is offered, it's all spiritualized. So this is the business of the devotee. We want to convert matter into spirit. And we do it by proper action. By utilizing everything in the service of Krishna, then matter can be made into spirit. Okay, then the next section is describing the different types of yagnas. Now I think it would be good if we look through these verses on our own and beginning from text 25 up to 29, I want you to write down, see if you can write down the different yagyas which are recommended in these verses. So 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, you just, you just have to read the translation, you don't need to read the purports. And just go through the translation and write down the different types of sacrifices which are being mentioned. Is everyone clear what you have to do? Yes, verses 25 to 28. 29, yeah. 29. Just read the translations. You don't need to go into the purport. Just from the translations. What sacrifices? are being recommended.
Okay. Hare Krishna. So, what kind of sacrifices are mentioned in text number 25? Fire sacrifices for us, Udgim, and demigod worship. Demigod worship. Yes. Worship of the demigods. Why, why do people worship the demigods? Marriage for some material benefit. Right, for fruitive benefit, right. And what about the fire? You said other people, what are they doing? Brahman worship. Huh? Supreme Brahman Maharaj. Brahman, Brahman worship. Uh, worship the Brahman. So what's their idea? What kind of philosophy have they got? Jnana. Jnana Maharaj. Yes. Jnana, Jnana. And what's their goal? Brahman. Uh, Merging into Brahman. Right, right, that's right. There go, merging into the Brahman. Okay, good. So those two are there in 25. Going on to 26, then what's mentioned there? Hearing process. Brahmacharis hearing process. Okay, the Brahmacharis will do the hearing process. And then another one? The householders regulating their senses and controlling mind. Okay, yes. Good. Okay. Any other processes there in that twenty six? Okay, go ahead, twenty seven. What sacrifices are there? That is talking, 27 is talking about uh, control of the mind and senses. And that is through uh, the life air, like you're controlling the mind and senses through controlling the air. And that is Dhyana Yoga. Uh, dhyana Yoga, right, okay. Meditation, some Dhyana Yoga meditation, yeah. Controlling the life affairs. Focus. Yes. Focusing on prana. Focusing on prana, the okay. vital air. Okay, prana. prana. Vital. Yes, the outgoing, the life air, talking about the, the life breath. Okay, and who's doing that kind of yoga? Yanis. Yeah. So this is uh, this could be is this Astanga Yoga? Not yet. Yeah, this is just some prana yoga. Pranayama, mainly pranayama. Pranayama. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, Prabhupada talks about Patanjali. Anyway. So that's mainly dealing with Astanga. Going ahead, number 28. Astanga Yoga. Completely Astanga Yoga. Oh. And Gnana Yoga. Hmm. Strict vows, becoming enlightened, sacrificing their possessions. So there, there's two kinds of sacrifices in general. One was to sacrifice possessions, and the other is the sacrifice of the self or sacrifice of knowledge. So here it mentions some become enlightened by sacrificing their possessions and others by performing severe austerities. So some are sacrificing their possessions just like also in demigod worship they would sacrifice some possessions. So they sacrifice possessions. Uh, others are performing strict vows, austerities, doing tapasya. And what else are they doing? Eightfold yoga, astanga yoga, and then also studying the Vedas, studying the Vedas to advance in transcendental knowledge. So that's a different or proper. It says or by studying the Vedas to advance in transcendental knowledge. 
So that is the sacrifice of Vedic study. And then text 29, what kind of sacrifices have we got? It is again uh, pranayama, that's outcoming, incoming breath control. Yes, pranayama. And remain in trance. Okay. Pranayama and dhyana. Uh -huh. And then others? Dealing the eating process. Yes, eating, controlling the eating process. And then another one? No. Stopping all breathing, Maharaj. Stopping all like breathing. Or Maharaj did. At some point of Okay, so let's see how many here you, we've listed the different ones. Karma Yoga, that was the worship of the demigods. And the Jnana Yogi, the Jnana Yagya, that was the, the one merging with the Supreme, mentioned in the first one. And then the Brahmacharis, they're doing Swadhyaya ya Yagna, the education, the study, the knowledge. And the Grihastas, Vishaya Yagna, controlling the senses. And Jnana Yogi, controlling the indriyas and prana and then dravya yagna giving charity we never heard that one dravya yagna where is it mentioned sacrificing positions Maharaj. it is in 428 428 what does it say 428 read possessions Possessions. Okay, sacrificing possessions. Eh? So that's chari giving charity, right? And then Chandrayana Tapo Yagna, bodily mortification. So that's the austerity part. And yoga Yagna, the Astanga Yoga, Veda part, the, for studying the Veda, knowledge of Veda. Pranayama, Parayana, controlling eating habits. Okay, so, so many different sacrifices are there. And Prabhupada says two categories. One is sacrificing of knowledge, other is sacrificing of possessions. So of the two, which is greater? Which one is greater, sacrifice of knowledge or sacrifice of possessions? Knowledge, knowledge. Yes, right. Why? Because we will learn uh, who is the Supreme Person of your body and how to how to please Krishna. Yes, we sacrifice material possessions, you can replace them. You just replace them, right? You give the things away, you get more. You give you give away in charity. You get you give your money away. You get more money. <laughs> you know you're always replacing it. Your your possessions. You get more. You can replace it. You give it away. You get more. But knowledge is something very special. You have knowledge. You cultivate knowledge. You can give that knowledge. It's more valuable. Okay. Maharaj, I have a question in, in this uh, section we just did. Yes. Maharaj, in the verse 25, it is said, perfect worship of demigods. So, Maharaj, I was just wondering, uh, perfectly worshipping uh, the demigods, is that ever possible? Because Prabhupada in some places says, you know, that demigod worship is always... Uh, with motive, it's never without motive. So, what does here Prabhupada mean when he says perfectly worshipping the demigods? Well, there were people who worshipped the demigods, but understanding the demigods to be a part of the Supreme Lord. And that was shown in, in it's in there in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Bharat Maharaj is worshipping the Supreme. And he was worshipping the different demigods and offering oblations to them 
and he, he, he could understand these different demigods are all different parts of the limbs of the Supreme Lord. So when he offered to the, made offerings to each of the different demigods, it was with that understanding that he is offering to a different limb of the Supreme Lord. That they're not the Supreme, but they're a part of the Supreme. So that kind of worship of demigods, that is perfect. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. But generally people worship for material desires. Okay, we'll go ahead. Transcendental knowledge. Okay, so here is the verse, right? Well-known verse, very famous. I'm sure you all know it. Uh, how to approach the spiritual teacher, right? So the process of attaining Atma Gyan, right? Because we said transcend the path of transcendental knowledge, the sacrifice of knowledge is greatest. So how to get that transcendental knowledge? So Lord Krishna said, just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively, render service unto him. Self-realized soul can impart knowledge unto you because they have seen the truth. So this is a very important verse in the Bhagavad Gita. It describes the qualification of the aspiring person to get knowledge, the person who wants knowledge, what his qualification, what his mood should be, and also the qualification of the person who is giving the knowledge, what he sh how he should be. Both are described there in the verse. Tadvidi uh, pranipatena. Pranipatena means that one should uh, fall down without reservation. One should submit oneself before the spiritual master. One should be willing to fall down in the presence of the spiritual teacher and fall down without reservation, without considering, oh, I've got my good cloth on, I might get dirty, or I'm not going to bow down, you know. Some people, they don't like to bow down. No, we should, we should bow down without hesitation before the spiritual teacher. That's the first thing. Pranipatena, that we fall down in front of him. And then Pariprashnena means we have to put inquiries. We should inquire from him submissively, not challengingly. When we inquire, when we inquire from the spiritual teacher, it's important that the attitude should be right. So in the purport there to this verse, Srila Prabhupada talks about the attitude, how it may be wrong. It may be challenging or it may be some absurd inquiry. Can you think of some examples of a, a challenging inquiry or a, an, absurd, an absurd inquiry? Mara, challenging can be, can you show me God? Okay, yes, can you show me God? Uh, Maharaj, like one time one reporter asked Prabhupada, like, why you have bald hair, all of bald hair, why you are not having any hairs? Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Challenging. Maharaj, uh, in my childhood, when I just uh, came into uh, uh, Krishna consciousness. So I I was sitting besides with His Holiness Sukhdev Swami Maharaj, and uh, I was asking that what is the need of chanting 16 rounds? Your your devotees here in the temple are uh, going here and there and doing chanting. What is the need of doing this this kind of chanting? So rather do two rounds than to do 16 rounds. So I was challenging this way. Okay, yes. Yeah, people often challenge. So this is not the right mood in approaching the spiritual teacher. 
We have to inquire submissively. And we should render service. There should be that seva, rendering service to him. So this is the qualification of the disciple. Then the qualification of the, the teacher, the spiritual master is described. First of all, it says that they have seen the truth. They, have, they know the truth, they've seen the truth, and they can also reveal it to others. They're tattvadarshi. Tattvadarshi, they've had darshan of the truth. And they can reveal it to others. That's important. Not just that someone may say, well, I know the truth, I just can't put it into words, I can't tell you. No, the, the qualification is not only have they seen the truth, but they are able to reveal it and to present it to others. So this is important also. So both qualifications should be there for the bona fide transmission of spiritual knowledge. It's always uh, challenging some, you get people, they're not so familiar with this and they will come and challenge. Sometimes they would say to Prabhupada, why you have to sit on the big seat? We're all sitting on the floor. Why you have to sit on the big seat? And Prabhupada would say to them, are you jealous? <laughs> uh, sometimes and then you get stupid questions, stupid questions like, can God make a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? <laughs> you know, this is a kind of abs absurd, absurd inquiry. Have you heard that question before? Can God... Yes, while, pre yes, while preaching, we had one, one of the such kind of questions, like if Krishna had so many wives, why can't we have... So many kinds of wives. <laughs> yeah. These kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Krishna has so many wives, why can't we have? Yeah. The, the envy is there. <laughs> they can't even take care of one, they want to have many. Okay. Let's see. So here's an exercise for you. Uh, you can take a partner and discuss if the, these following, how to deal with these different issues. Mm -hmm. All right. How many people do we have today? Is it 12? 16, Maharaj. Oh, 16. Oh, wow. So many. Okay. So, pairs have a partner. Then you can take these different questions and see how many you can come up with some good answers, right? First of all, I am my own guru, I don't need anyone else. I simply follow Shastra, which is the highest authority because it was spoken by Lord Krishna. And you, so go, you go through these ones and maybe Maybe we should divide them up and then it will be a, a bit quicker for us, huh? Uh, eight, uh, we have 16, so eight pair, eight groups, eight teams. So uh, we can give numbers. One, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. So that you, each question there will be two teams working on it. Two pair, two teams. So that's like four. Is somebody here to divide the devotees, to give people a partner? Yes, yes, Maharaj. So for eight groups we have? Yes, we'll have eight groups, eight groups of two, and give each group a number, and then one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. Five will do the same as one, and six will do two, and seven will do three, and eight will do four. Right? Yes. Yes. I will one gana group.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. <laughs> How are you, Maharaj? Yeah, surviving. <laughs> <laughs> How is the cases there in Cochin now? A lot. Thousand plus. Oh, every day. Mm, very much. Mm. Every day, thousand. Janmashtami day, Maharaj. Huh? Krishna Janmashtami. Where? In Mayapur. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had. Did you watch on? Yeah. Did you watch on? Yes, I watch online. Okay. Everything is online. <laughs> yeah, good. That's nice. You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> exactly, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where is my partner? My partner missing already. Who's your partner? <laughs> Must be me. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay Maharaj. So, so, what number are we? Uh, room number six. Six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So question two. Question two. Have you got the questions? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, question two is unless someone can reply to any question I ask, I cannot and I should not accept him as a spiritual master. He must have seen the truth. He must have seen the truth. Unless somebody can answer all my questions. I consider him in the group. How should I answer this moment? Well, I would think that, okay, but somebody may answer the questions. How do you know the answers are right? Basically, <laughs> <Yes, please. laughs> Maharaj. Because we also don't know. Uh, yeah. How do you know his answers are right? You're going to accept yes. anybody who answered, but you don't know what his answer is. His answers are yes. correct or not. So. Yes. We need to know the... But then the thing is that, Maharaj, sometimes in the, in the beginning, we also don't know. Unless that, that person is from a bona fide world. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, they should be in the... Yeah. Because be. otherwise, we don't know whether it's the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have to support the answer, sadhu, shastra, and guru, right? Yes, Maharaj. So, oh, somebody's come. Swarup. Oh, Krishna. <laughs> Swarup Gopa out there to be with you. Okay, I'll leave you to You work with him. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Only number two, Maharaj. Yeah. If you can do more, if you're satisfied, if you feel you haven't answered, you can do more. Be, okay, Maharaj. Be good. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Which question are you doing, Prabhu? Number two. Number two? Okay. Yes. Have you got some answer for it? Um, we were just reading the four words. I'm waiting for a discussion. But uh, I have some ideas to answer. Um, I would say. First of all, I think the first thing which came into my mind is saying that I, I will not trust anyone or he must have, he must see the truth. It's kind of like saying I already know the truth and in a way of kind of like um, challenging the spiritual masters and then saying and that was the first thing which came to my mind. Yeah, and, uh, it's true. Hmm. If somebody said they have to have seen the truth. That means you know what is the truth, <laughs> right? Yes. 
or, or somebody says that they have to answer all my questions, you have to know the answers. You won't know, how do you know their answers are correct? So, so we have to hear from the proper channels. Okay, is this your partner here, this Maharaji? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Okay, you can look at other questions also, Prabhu. If you feel we, you can go on to the, some look through the other questions and just see if you can come up with some answers. Recording in progress. Life. And uh, in the Mahabharata also this uh, verse comes uh, where it says Ki, uh, it is very difficult to understand the uh, path of dharma. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So you, which, you're doing question number three? Yes, Maharaj. We did three and uh, yeah, we were going to question one as well, like, but we did three already. Okay, what was your answer for number three? Maharaj, first point we discussed was about uh, rejecting blind following. In the sense, because uh, Guru is, uh, uh, is present, you have faith in Guru doesn't mean you follow blindly, without understanding. That's, that's one point we discussed. And uh, there was uh, this example, we are not able to completely come up with the exact uh, example, but there was one example from hearing we know that Guru was traveling on a horse and with disciples. Guru falls down and disciples just keep walking. So Guru gives instruction, you know, just if something falls, you pick up. And the disciples then, you know, without uh, in, uh, using intelligence, the horse is passing stool and they start collecting because anything is falling, they are collecting. There was something around this one. I, I forgot the complete analogy, Maharaj, but that's what we were trying to come up with, with this one, that not just uh, blindly following, you have to use intelligence also. Uh -huh. Yes, right. <laughs> mm. We shouldn't be shouldn't be stupid, you should use some intelligence to understand how to apply the teachings of the spiritual master. Okay. And another point uh, was Maharaj was like, we should not assume things, we should, uh, like Prabhupada mentions, should get a clear understanding from him. Should not assume things. Should not what? We should not assume things on our own, like Prabhupada says in the purport. Uh, that we should get a clear understanding from him in submission, service and inquiry. Oh, we shouldn't make assumptions. Yes, uh, like it. Guru is saying something, we assume 10 other things and do this seva or whatever is told. Uh -huh. To clarify. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so it's fine. Okay, let me end the room and we'll get everyone back together. Recording in progress. Okay, can can yes, can we can close the rooms, Prabhu. Yes, everyone back now.
Okay, so the first question, I am my own guru, I don't need anyone else. I simply follow Shastra, which is the highest authority, because it was spoken by Lord Krishna. So, any conclusions about this? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes, group number one? Or group number five? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Patita. Oh, Parta, right? Parta. Parta Pran, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. We are from group number seven. Oh, okay. You have a question? You have the answer to number one? I want no, to... Maharaj. We have done the fourth one. Okay. I'm, I'm looking for answers for number one first. I am my own guru. Who is group number one or group number five? Or anybody has the answer for number one? You want to contribute something? How yes, you? Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu, please. Uh, Maharaj, uh, in uh, Gita, uh, Lord says, Eva Parampara Prabhupada. So the knowledge can be only gained by a Parampara system. And even Lord accepted uh, Guru himself. And if we see that if some people follow Shastras, then they have been misled many times and we see that Mahdi's also follow Shastras. But yet, uh, Lord says Bhakti Yoga is topmost. Okay. So, is this devotee, is this idea, I'm my own guru, I just follow Shastra, is that okay? Maharaj, we can also, we can also say that, you know, if I just, uh, attend a university of law school or a doctor and I just study books, nobody will accept me. I have to go through a proper institution. So, yes, I need an authority, a teacher. If just reading books, nobody will accept my qualification. Yes, you're just going to follow Shastra only. You're not going to have guru. You don't need sadhu. Right? And, uh, uh, Maharaj in Mahabharata also this verse comes where it says the principles of dharma are very difficult to understand. So, uh, like that's why there are like uh, 12 Mahajans who knows these principles correctly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Dharma shatatvam nitam gohayam mahajano yena gata sapanta. The absolute truth is hidden in the hearts of the pure devotees. And you can understand it simply by following in the footsteps of the great souls, the Mahajans. Right? That's the verse you're talking about. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. It's also in Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, if someone says, I am my own guru, I don't need anyone else. What are you going to say to this person? Maybe they are just assume, assume the words of the Lord before following the authority. Make the assumption, Maharaj? Yeah, we, we did Krishna have, did Krishna say I'm a, my own guru? Did Krishna, did he study from anybody? Sandipa Muni Maharaj. Yeah, he studied, right? Why? To, to establish this process. Yeah, to, to show the example, right? He has to establish, to show people that it's important. Krishna. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also accepted. Right. And somebody saying, I'm my own guru, I have Shastra. Do we say just Shastra only? No, we say Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. The sha Sadhu and the Gurus, they show us how to apply the Shastra. How to understand the Shastra. Maharaj, we also saw in chapter 3 that Krishna is saying that if he does not follow these rules and regulations, the whole world will go into ruination. So he's setting up by his own example that yes, this is the path to be followed. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay, let's go on number 2. Unless someone can reply to any question I ask, I cannot and should not accept him as a spiritual master. He must have seen the truth. Durim Prabhu, Durim was working on this, right? Yes, um, yeah, I was thinking, um, 
you're, if you're asking if, if this kind of statement is kind of like challenging the spiritual masters, it's kind of saying that I already have seen the truth, I already know the, kind of the answers, I'm waiting for these question, uh, answers coming from that spiritual master. And it's kind of not only challenge. I was thinking, it's not only like challenging the spiritual master, but the whole parampara, because he's coming out with societal succession, so challenging in an uh, indirect way, kind of all it's sufficient because you're, you think you already know, so you're putting yourself above, yes. above that. Yes, right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, Marika Mahatma Ji had a nice point. She was saying it also depends what kind of questions you ask. So if you just ask things like, will it rain tomorrow? This will not be helpful for Krishna consciousness. And then you kind of reject everyone who is not giving. I'm sorry, answer. Prabhu, the voice wasn't very clear. It's breaking on me here. Could you repeat um, that? Yes. Aritika Mataji also had a nice point, which she was saying, it also depends what kind of questions we ask. There should be always questions for like, to attain Krishna consciousness. If we challenge Guru saying, tell me how the weather will be tomorrow, and will it rain, and this and that, and these kind of questions, in that way we will, it's like wrong. So, yes, yeah. right, yeah. Someone has to answer my question. When somebody came like that to Prabhupada in Delhi, there was a big pandal one time, and there was this one young man there, and the young man came, he was saying to Prabhupada, you answer my question. <laughs> and Prabhupada said to him, I am not your servant. <laughs> The problem, and there's a, it's quite an argument, you know, and some people were upset. Some people were upset. They said Prabhupada shouldn't get angry at somebody. But the devotees understood that Prabhupada was making the point that unless you submit to the authority, there's no point in answering questions. If somebody doesn't accept you as the authority, why should you bother to answer their questions? So this is actually challenging. The devotee is saying they have to reply to my questions, then only I will accept. <laughs> this is a very challenging way of approaching the spiritual master. He must have seen the truth. <laughs> if you approach like that, don't bother coming. Don't bother approaching. You, know, you don't want to. You, we don't want to see a person like that. Go away. You know. Okay. So. Very challenging attitude. Yes, uh, Krishna Premi Maharaji, do you have anything else to add to this? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, the Guru, geez, yeah, I, 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 I agree that it's a very challenging uh, tool, very challenging question. But the Guru also gave, when he gives the instructions based on the Sastras. Yes. You know, a genuine Guru, uh, one of my Guru. Yes, he must. He must speak according to Shastra. Yes, yes, Maharaj. That's one point I can think of. Then somebody, the, the, somebody's maybe he's asking questions, as uh, Durin Prabhu said, the question should be in relation to the absolute truth, not just some general knowledge question. You know, what's the cure for cancer? Or how's the weather tomorrow? There must be spiritual questions, spiritual inquiries, desire to understand the absolute truth. So if you, so Maharaj, can we say that even if even if uh, they are trying to, you know, say that I have seen the truth, but how will you know? In the sense, I may say that yes, this is a diamond pen, but if you have not seen a diamond, how will you know? So that kind of inco that kind of attitude is also bogus in the sense you don't know what God is and how can you accept whether the opposite party is saying yes this is God that is God right yeah so you're putting yourself up like a spiritual master <laughs> before why why a spiritual master why why he would want to accept you as a disciple you already know everything so <laughs> go away you know. We don't need those kind of people. So the right attitude has to be there. So that's why it says uh, pranipatena, you have to submit. There has to be genuine humility in approaching the spiritual teacher. 
Okay, number three, I'm so lucky that I have guru. Now I don't have to think. Right? Group number three. Yes, Maharaj, we discussed about how blind following is, is condemned here. It, it's not that you just follow blindly. Rather, uh, we have to use intelligence and we have to uh, not be like, become stupid in the sense it's not just that uh, we uh, close our eyes and follow. It's just we have to use intelligence also to follow the instructions properly. Right, yeah. Yeah, you can't just be a blind follower. And when they were discussing, when I was in the group with them, uh, Maharaji came up with the example about the, the guru who was riding on the cart with the disciples and some things fell off the cart. Some of the possessions fell off the cart and the, nobody bothered to pick them up. So when they got to the place, the guru asked, what happened to all the things which were on the back? And the disciples said, oh, they fell off. And the guru said, well, why didn't you pick them up? And they said, oh, we, we didn't know. We didn't, we didn't think about that. So the guru said, anything falls off, you should pick it up. So next day they were going along and they were on, they, they were on a cart pulled by a, a bull and the bull passed stool. So they picked up the stool of the bull. They picked it up and there was a smell all the time. They could smell the stool. And the guru said, what happened? What's that smell? And then they found out that they picked up the stool which the, the, the bull was passing. And they said, well, you told us to pick up everything which falls off. So we thought we should pick it up too. So this is kind of foolishness which people may have sometimes. So people should learn to think. We should think properly. Yes, it's good you have a guru, you're lucky. But it's not that we don't have to think. We have to think carefully, we have to think how to, how to inquire what's a, a good question to put before the spiritual master and we should think about how to serve also, how to serve the spiritual teacher, how to serve his mission, or how to please him. So not that we don't have to think, we have to use the mind in the service of Krishna, we have to think. And think about service, our position as servant. And so we should be thinking like that, how to serve, how to improve my service. So we have to always be thinking about how to improve in my service. Right? Any other points? Number three? Maharaj, we also discussed about how uh, if it if we don't uh, inquire, then we are assuming things, which is also not recommended, that mental concoction, it becomes a mental concoction. So we are not meant to assume also, rather we have to inquire submissively rather than just assume and follow blindly. Okay. Yeah. Don't just assume. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Number four, I am by nature inquisitive. So I like to ask questions, but I can't see the need of rendering personal service in the process of acquiring knowledge. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, so we discussed this. Yes, okay. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. So we discussed this question, Maharaj. So... Prabhu, you are muted. Sorry, sir. In this question, Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada writes in the purport, uh, inquiries and submission constitute the proper combination for spiritual understanding. The main point is unless there is submission and service, inquiries from the learned spiritual master will not be effective. So without service, uh, progress cannot happen. So for that, uh, especially when we are really practicing uh, pra a mood of servitorship, like you have discussed about the mood of servitorship will make us free from karma. That mood has to be practiced uh, so as to realize that consciousness or bring it into our consciousness. Otherwise, it will not be effective. Okay, so the mood of service has to be there. The mood of rendering personal service. Well, yes. 
who who are we supposed to render service to? Spiritual master Maharaj. Because Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada says in the last statement, satisfaction of the self in a spiritual master is the secret of advancement in spiritual life. So the secret is to satisfy the spiritual master, self in a spiritual master. Okay. So, yes. yes. Another example, Maharaj, we discussed oh, earlier. Right. In this, uh, in this word, uh, Prabhupada mentions one thing in Prabhupada, that is, you know, false prestige. So, Sri Baldi Vijabhushan is saying that Tad in this word is used for Jiva. And the meaning of Tad is the knowledge of different sacrifices which Krishna already explained previously from verse 32 to 35. So if one, without doing any kind of service, if he just follow these sacrifices, so what he will gain in return of, you know, following and practicing all these sacrifices is just a prestige, nothing else. So he will be fogged up with his prestige and which will be a reason for his downfall. So that's why Prabhupada is especially using this word that without false prestige, so once we do the services to our spiritual master, once we accept a spiritual master and render some menial service to him, then all these false prestige of practicing all these sacrifices will go by. So that is one analogy uh, that uh, I draw from that. Okay, thank you very much for that. All this false prestige can be removed through the mood of selfless service. Shastra. Discuss another example, Maharaj. Yes. Which is, which is very apt for this. <coughs> which is once Madan Mohan Malvi approaches uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasa Thakur uh, for some inquiries. He is he's a big person. He, had, uh, he comes to Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasa Thakur for some inquiries. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasa Thakur says that I am a little busy. I have my disciples inside. They will answer your question. And the disciple instead is engaged in service. And then Madan Mohan Malia goes inside and then asks the disciple, I have some questions. The disciple says, you help me with this service. And then later on, uh, I will answer your questions. And then he, Madan Mohan Malia engages in service. And after all the service is done, when he comes home, Bhaktisya says, asks me, I mean, uh, you can ask questions now. He says, no, no, all my questions are answered. So even it's the other way. If you do service, render service to spiritual master or devotees, uh, actually, our inquiries will be uh, resolved in that way also. Okay, yes, good. Prabhupada uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati pastime there. By service, all our questions can be answered. Yes, so by serving the devotees, opens the doors to liberation. So, very important to have the mood of servant. Without giving service, then we think of ourselves as a master. So it's very purifying for us to give service to the to the pure-hearted souls. So we always want to try to take that opportunity. We would always, uh, when Prabhupada would be in Vrindavan, Prabhupada would go on a walk in the morning. And most of the devotees, they all wanted to go with Prabhupada on the walk, but only a few people would be allowed to go usually, only, you know, very senior men, sannyasis or temple leaders, they could go on the, on the walk. But usually I would stay back, we'd help to clean Prabhupada's room, and we would clean Prabhupada's room very carefully. You know, put every day, put a clean sheet out on the floor and it would be gaddy and change the covers and everything, everything would be spotlessly clean. And the flowers would be arranged every day, water added and everything. We'd do everything we could to make Prabhupada's room perfect. So that, I, that point of, you know, the idea of doing service, it, it, it's really very purifying. And by service also it awakens transcendental knowledge. Okay, here's a quote from the purport of text 34, which you just read. Anyway, I'll read it again. Mental speculation or dry arguments cannot help lead one to the right path. 
nor by independent study of books of knowledge can one progress in spiritual life. One has to approach a bona fide spiritual master to receive the knowledge. Such a spiritual master should be accepted in full surrender, and one should serve the spiritual master like a menial servant without false prestige. Satisfaction of the self-realized spiritual master is the secret of advancement in spiritual life. Inquiries and submission constitute the proper combination for spiritual understanding. Unless there is submission and service, inquiries from the learned spiritual master will not be effective. So, of course, these were just quoted by our devotees there, by our teams. So, very good. Here's a conversation. Prabhupada's talking. Maybe you'd like to read this. Somebody could be Madhuvisa Parta Prabhu. You'd be Madhuvisa. And during Prabhu, you can be Prabhupada. So go ahead, read. One cannot become a medical practitioner by simply reading the books. He must study under a medical practitioner. So in the case of your books, is it possible to become a devotee without actually having personal association with you? Just by reading your books. During your... Oh, I'm sorry. No, it is not that you have to associate it with the author. But one who knows, if you cannot understand, you have to take lessons from him. Not necessarily that you have to connect with the author always. I'll be the devotee. Just like, just like the textbooks are not written by the teachers, they're written by other professors. Usually they don't even meet the author. Simply one who knows the subject matter, he can explain. But, but can your word... But can you, would your purpose, would that serve as explanation besides? No, no. Anyone who knows the subject matter, he will be able to explain. Not necessarily the author is required to be present there. To study from a medical man, I never said you have to study from the author. But one who understands the author's purpose, just like we are explaining Bhagavad Gita as it is, not that one has to learn directly from Krishna, one who has understood Krishna from him, from him. That is the Parampara system. Okay, so Prabhupada's explaining. Somebody who has understood, that's the important point. We have to learn, we can't, ex we can't expect to learn from the author, but we can learn from somebody who's understood through the Parampara. Okay, nice example. Uh, go ahead, uh, text 36. In the ocean, however, expert a swimmer one may be, the struggle for existence is very severe. If someone comes forward and lifts a struggling swimmer from the ocean, he is the greatest saviour. Right? Text 30, 36. Material existence is like an ocean. So how to get out? We need Krishna to come on the back of Garuda and pick us up. So Prabhupada said, we require hundreds and thousands of spiritual masters who have understood this Krishna science and preach all over the world. Therefore, we have formed this society and we, we invite all sincere souls to take part in the society and become a spiritual master and preach the science all over the world. This is a great necessity. There is a great necessity of this knowledge. So Prabhupada is encouraging and he's inviting all of you become a spiritual master, just like Lord Chaitanya said. Amara Gaya Guru Hana Tarayadesh. By my order, you become a guru and save the land. Lord Chaitanya ordered, here Srila Prabhupada is also telling us, everyone, become a spiritual master. Preach, all of, preach this message. There's a great need. So, three qualifications to get this knowledge. We want to have the, what should be the, what's the qualification? First of all, 
Shraddhavan must have faith. And then, secondly, Tatpara, steady in his performance, dedicated. Steady, it means like every day we follow, we do chanting every day, every day we follow the principles. And then, Sanyatendriya, attain control of his senses. So three important qualifications, faith. Very important, you have to have faith. Sometimes people have problems, they have weak faith. What could be an obstacle to our faith? Maybe a very senior man has a problem, spiritual problem, it gives up Krishna consciousness even, or a fall down. Then our faith could be affected. We have to be very careful. Keep faith in Krishna and in Prabhupada. Prabhupada told, don't be surprised who goes away. <laughs> be surprised people stay. And steady in our performance, to be dedicated, to be steady. That's, how do we get that? Well, by practice we become steady. In the beginning we won't be so steady, but gradually we become fixed in this. We understand that the program, the spiritual program is very good for our consciousness, it helps us. And we, we, we like to do it. We like to wake up and chant in the morning. We like to read Bhagavatam. We like to go to temple and see RT. And then control of the senses. Again, this is practice, training, the preliminary training of Krishna consciousness. Maybe brahmacharya, something like that. Maybe but if you're married, of course, then anyway, in household life. That we have to also be trained, we have to practice. An unqualified person for knowledge and the result of the, the result for that person. Not everybody is qualified for this knowledge. So some people are unqualified. Who's unqualified? Mentioned here. Ignorant and faithless persons. Faithless who doubt the revealed scriptures. So they do not attain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. Text number 40. So we ask you, what gives you faith in scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness? What gives you faith in the scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness? What doubts, if any, do you have regarding scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness? And what steps are you making to overcome these doubts? Okay? First question. What gives you faith in the scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness? Would someone like to tell us? Do you have faith? In the scriptures? Why? Maharaj, I have faith in scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness because like it is said, the proof of pudding is in eating. So I have, I have to my limited extent practiced what is said in the scriptures and I have seen the change in my life and I have seen the others around me like who are practicing, I have seen the change in them. So I know that I have faith that, you know, what if I, if I follow what is said in scriptures, then uh, that is giving me, uh, following it is giving me faith. And I have seen in my experience that, you know, I, it is definitely working what is said. C can you give some details about what changes people went through? Like, uh, Maharaj, I... Uh, in my family, I never assumed, like I never expected like my mother to give up coffee. She was so strong coffee drinker that you can smell the coffee from at least, you know, few feet away. But now she has accepted initiation. She was actually hankering for initiation. She's like, I want initiation. I want initiation. And now finally she's initiated and she's following it so firmly. I never expected that to happen. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Very good. Anybody else would like to contribute to this? 
why you have faith in the scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I have faith in scriptures as you know, the uh, scriptures are the science. The science that we study in our school and colleges are very limited. And to say they are very imperfect uh, because they are being uh, narrated by someone which, which do have imperfect senses. So these are the signs uh, which gives us the clear understanding of who we exactly are and where we came from and what is our uh, roles and responsibility. <coughs> and uh, so this is why I have faith in these scriptures and the process of Krishna consciousness is not only for this life. The basic understanding of Bhagavad Gita uh, goes with this thing that you are not this body and your soul. So if you go on with this understanding, a lot of our problems are solved. Uh, this is why I have faith in this process and the process of this Okay, thank you very much. Very nice. How about doubts? What doubts, if any, do you have regarding scriptures and the process of devotional service? Anybody has any doubts? I mean, what kind of doubts, even if you don't have it, maybe have you seen doubts in other people? Do you know some doubts in but other people? I, I had encountered, you know, I can uh, narrate to one anecdote of this. My Gurudev was once mentioning this to me, that one Srila Prabhupada asked him in a, in a very initial meeting, that you start, give this life to Krishna. And then he said that even if nothing happened, still, it's just a matter of one life. You had already wasted so many lives, which you can't count on. So just give this life to Krishna. Even if nothing happens, it's just a matter of one life. And what will you miss? You are eating nice prashadam. You are dancing every day in the morning. You are enjoying. So even if there is any doubt, I mean, if I come across any doubt within my mind, I just think like this, that even if, you know, nothing happens, this is then this is just a matter of one life. What else? Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Maharaj, sometimes I have doubt whether I I don't doubt on the scriptures, but I doubt on on uh, on my sincerity that will I be able to accomplish all this in this life. So mm -hmm. it's not doubt basically regarding scriptures or process, but you know the 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 understanding that you know how from Vaidhi to sadhana how from Vaidhi bhakti to raganuga bhakti that transcend how will i be able to transcend like like that kind of doubt how it, with my current level of consciousness will i be able to progress to spontaneous uh, kind of uh, uh, devotion no okay so uh, what steps are you over, are you taking to overcome this kind of doubt So Maharaj, I am uh, tr tr trying to follow the instructions of Guru Sadhu and Shastra that, you know, and hoping that the day will come soon or it will come. But yes, the more I hear, the more I see who are practicing, the more uh, I feel that, yes, if I follow, then it will come. Yes. Yes, we may wonder, just like in, in the sixth chapter, Arjuna also had a doubt that what if I practice, I'm giving up everything and I'm not successful, then what will happen, you know, if I don't get success, if I'm not able to complete the process and I gave up everything material, but I also, I'm not successful with the spiritual, then what will be my position? Oh, so then Krishna explains that. Still, you have a very good destination. You'll be able to go on in the next life. You go on as much advancement as you make in this life, you'll never lose it. And you can continue from where we left off in the next life. But in material life, whatever we do, it's all finished at the time of death. And we have to begin again in the next life. So that's one doubt. Okay, and sometimes may, we may have doubts about uh, the future of the Krishna consciousness movement. You know, what if the movement falls apart? Maybe there's nobody to run the temples, there's no devotees to maintain the temples. And, and what are we going to do? I mean, 
when I joined the Krishna consciousness movement, I was, you know, we, we were always struggling to pay the rent, we never had any money, and I thought, how long we can go on like this? I thought, you know, this movement can never last. But still, and it's still going on so many years. You know, I was thinking, and you know, this is not going to last, <laughs> but still going on by the grace of Krishna. So we have to take shelter of the process of devotional service. And all the doubts will be removed. Krishna is Madhusudana, kills the demon of doubts. So we take shelter of Lord Krishna. Any other comments? Um, I'm just wanted to show you about doubts. <clears throat> maybe it's because I'm from a Western background, or maybe from a Muslim background, and so I sometimes reading the scriptures. It's not that I, I doubt that there are revealed scriptures, but I just question a lot about the things which are happening, like um, things which I never experienced, which are way going out of my, my little brain, things happening. Is different stories and pastimes, and um, and there sometimes my mind comes in and is like, hey, can this really be true? Like, how is this possible? How is that possible? Like, this sounds super unnatural, like above nature, whatever. And um, and there sometimes I have doubts with that, but then at the same time I tell my mind kind of to shut off, shut up, not shut up, but to be silent. And I ask myself, like, how do you know? How should I know if this is true or not? Like, how do I know if this happened or not? I'm living now in this body with my small brain, and I have no idea what happens before and what will happen in the future. I'm just here to follow the process. And I just simply tell myself to listen, just continue listening. And by listening, I also experience that the doubts will go away. By listening to, um, advanced devotees, this mind also stops and calms down. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yes, very nice. Yeah, we just have to hear, keep hearing. The hearing will purify us, take away the doubts. And chanting also, chanting the holy name, hearing the holy name, because all the knowledge is there within the holy name. That's so right. For me, when I start to have doubts, I, I have to take shelter of the Holy Name. And I always get my doubts removed through the chanting. Everything is there in the Holy Name. All the Vedic knowledge is there within the Holy Name. So chanting has always kept me in Krishna consciousness, kept me away from all my doubts to get rid of all the doubts which come. Okay, so we'll go ahead. One who follows the instructions of the Bhagavad Gita, as it is imparted by the Lord, the Personality of Godhead Himself, becomes free from all doubts by the grace of transcendental knowledge. He, as a part and parcel of the Lord, in full Krishna consciousness, is already established in self-knowledge. As such, he is undoubtedly above bondage to action. Okay, so take shelter of Lord Krishna's instruction. Conclusion of the discussion of karma and jnana. The attainment of Brahmanishta by following the process of karma and jnana, which is explained in chapter 2 and 3, is concluded in verse 41 and 42. Brahmanishta, which means that he has given up all other activities and has dedicated his life to working only for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. So this is the conclusion, the process of karma and jnana, to take shelter of Krishna. We'll see also the famous verse, after many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, right? Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlava. So similar here, Brahmanishta, that has given up all other activities, and dedicated his life to serving Krishna. So this is the conclusion from text number 41. 
yoga sannyasa karmani karmanam one who has renounced karmanam the fruits of action by devotional service in karma yoga jnana sanchina samshayam whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge so we have doubts transcendental knowledge can destroy them read the book wherever you open the book that knowledge will answer your doubts take away the doubts that's the nature of the transcendental literature that all our doubts can be removed wherever you read okay just to look over what we studied here first of all uh, uh, explain the intricacies of karma right we were talking about karma and vikarma and akarma so we we talked about that and how the devotee is is, action, is in action in action and those who are not devotees they're doing action in inaction they may think they're stopped active activities but they still have karma and we looked at the different types of sacrifices which were listed there verses up 25 26 27 28 so many different processes of sacrifice some sacrificing possessions and some were the sacrifice of knowledge and then what should be the proper attitude in approaching the spiritual master so the proper attitude we said submission and surrender and give service then who is qualified and who is unqualified to receive transcendental knowledge lord krishna describes it if one does not have faith in the scriptures then he's unqualified one who is ignorant and faithless and who doubts the revealed scriptures then they're not qualified to receive this knowledge just like the ninth offense in chanting the holy name to instruct faithless persons about the chanting of the holy name people have no faith in the chanting and if we instruct them to chant it's not good they have to first of all develop faith well we can instruct them to chant but we don't tell them the glories of the chanting of the holy name to instruct the faithless persons about the glories of the holy name is the offense we tell everyone to chant but we don't tell them we don't tell them all the powers of the holy name then preaching application present appropriate arguments against various misconceptions in regards to the subject matter of the relationship between guru and disciple so we we have those different questions then personal application explained what gives him faith in scriptures and in the process of krishna consciousness along with what doubts he has and what he is doing to overcome the doubt what gives him faith in the scriptures and so we get a lot of faith by seeing others successful in practicing krishna consciousness when we see devotees dedicate themselves fully and like maraji was saying her own mother took initiation she could give up coffee drinking so we see people come to krishna consciousness with bad habits but they follow the scriptures and they become advanced it happens this is krishna's the mystery of krishna consciousness we see jagai and madhai they became great devotees they became part of lord chaitanya's tree and they were so sinful and degraded but they they completely transformed by the mercy of lord chaitanya and lord nichananda so there are many examples to inspire us to give us faith in the process of krishna consciousness and doubts well doubts can be removed by transcendental knowledge 
they can be removed by simply taking shelter of devotional service. And we have we have some doubts. Hmm. They can we we just have to overcome these doubts. We have to be willing to fight, right? Krishna tells Arjuna, stand and fight, Arjuna. Don't give up the battle. The nature of the mind is to doubt. The mind raises these doubts within us. We have to overcome these doubts. It's the nature of the mind. The mind will always say, oh, don't chant. The mind will say, oh, don't read the book. Oh, you've read this book before. Don't read it. The mind will always give us doubts. We have to conquer over the mind. And we can do it by Krishna consciousness. Okay, just a, a quote to finish off here from the purport of 42. This yoga has two divisions of sacrificial actions. One is called sacrifice of one's material possessions and the other is called knowledge of self, which is pure spiritual activity. When we come to spiritual activities, we find that this, these are also divided into two, namely, understanding of one's own self or one's constitutional position and the truth regarding the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One who follows the path of Bhagavad Gita as it is can very easily understand these two important divisions of spiritual knowledge. For him, there is no difficulty in obtaining perfect knowledge of the Self as part and parcel of the Lord. And such understanding is beneficial, for such a person can easily understand the transcendental activities of the Lord. So Prabhupada is explaining here two, two divisions of sacrificial action with the possessions and then knowledge. And then he explains, when we come to spiritual activities, two divisions again. First, we have to understand our own self. Our own self, meaning we're not the body, we're souls. And our soul is part and parcel of Lord Krishna. And then the truth regarding Krishna. In other words, just simply realizing I'm not the body, realizing I'm a soul, that is one part. But we have to go on and understand our relationship with Krishna. How we have some particular rasa with Krishna. So that is also there. That is part of spiritual uh, practice, spiritual activity. Knowing our relationship with Krishna. We're all Krishna's servants. All right, so this is the different phases of spiritual activity. Okay, so tomorrow we'll go on. We'll go on tomorrow with, to the fifth chapter, the first 12 verses. So if you have time, you can look over the first 12 verses of chapter 5. Are there any other questions or comments? Anything? Okay, so thank you very much. So we'll see you all tomorrow at the same time. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Gorbhakti Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Haribo Prabhu, come in.